It's the chief with Hamtag. Hamtag, we're Ham back. Tag. Greg Schmidtkin's here. Greg Schmidtkin's, here. Judd Vance. All right, and Judd, we're gonna have you lead off, and what are we doing? This is your topic idea, what are we doing? Games that are owned but unplayed. Something I've, as most, most when I come up with the idea, I thought, you know, I don't know any war gamers hardly that have played all their games. I have like 15 on my list. I figured you had about 1,500 and if one come in the mail today, Greg might have one. Just one, maybe. I've got, I've got a few. Yeah. I thought, well, maybe there's some ASL I will scenarios say, I don't played. have very many. Yeah. But you've called that. That's exactly it. By the way, we're on the uh, Scotch Test Dummy set. That's why you got all the whiskey here. The wall of board games is over there. My two hobbies continue. Yeah. So anyways, I thought, you know, this could be some people might really enjoy because I see these pop up. Hey, lots of games you have, but you really like to get on the table. So right. Hopefully they'll there's a lot of us. comments and there'll be some mocking. You oh, yeah. there should be a lot. Or dude, you're missing out type of stuff. Oh, God, we know it. There's too many games, not enough time, hence the shirt. I need time. <laughs> yeah. Go, brother, go. All right. My number five game that I own, I would love to get to the table, mm. is here come the Rebels. It is from 1993 by Joseph Balkowski. I hope I got his name right. Um, it is the second game in the great campaigns of the American Civil War. Got it about a month ago. Um, I was more than content. We did the Civil War. I had the series. I had it number one. That always made me real happy. And I heard so much hype. My buddy Rex, he's always talking about this game a lot. I mean, about the series, and so I, you know, a lot of people do. So I think it sounds pretty cool. And it's I, when I looked up the comments when it went on to pay it forward, it said well, I saw a lot of comments said this is one of the better games in the series. So I thought, hey, it might be a good place to jump in. And it's about Antietam. The only Antietam game I have is Glory Three. So it looked like a good place to jump in and try it out. I have Lee versus Grant, which I heard is kind of a predecessor to the series, right. and um, Korean War by this designer, and loved them both. Thought probably will work. So, and I love Civil War, but like I said, just got about a month ago, saw Gettysburg and Monmouth a week ago, so I've been just on this binge to go through about everything Gettysburg. So it's going to be eh, probably some, if I'm lucky, December sometime or earlier next year. Hmm. That's now, my number five. Now, what is this rifle? Do you know what's, I mean, it's like it's got yep. chambers in it. Okay. Almost like it's a, a little rifle. Repeater. Gatling gun, yeah. Right. Yep. Interesting. Hmm. And I love the artwork there. Well, all, all the games oh, this there. is Avalon Hill, by the way. I don't know if MMP, I think they reprinted this whole series. At least they took I'm it not over. Not the whole series, and okay. I cannot, I'm, I'm not sure which ones. Okay. I know that, uh, never mind, I'm not going to say what I know. Yeah, the, the nice thing is if you get in the series, there's an awful lot of games in it, so you got right. a lot of places to go. Right. Good. My number five is Fireteam Modern Squad Level Command. And the way this is built, and I picked it up a while ago, is that it's squad leader, so they're, they're not even saying quite the refined or, or polished ASL, but squad leader, modernized up, however with a really nice command and control element. And okay. most people, when I was reading, when I was looking to get it, because I was looking for a modern squad level uh, tactical war game, said that, uh, they wished it had caught fire a little bit more because they wished it would have had a few more scenarios and more polish that would have come out on it, okay. although it's good. Now what is interesting, uh, first it was 1987, um, John Southard, um, they have a reprint that they haven't stated when they're planning on it coming out now, but it's not quite a direct reprint. They call it Red Eclipse, Fireteam Red Eclipse, very kind of similar box design, but this is coming out from Lock and Load Publishers, and they went, went in and even talked about the Oda Loop is in there, which is, I know this from the both military and the police talk about it, observe, orient, decide, and act, which came from a fighter pilot talking about getting in the other person's Oda Loop. Okay. Now that's not this game, but there is something similar coming. The gist is why I haven't even taken it out of the shrink is that I'll start thinking about it and then something will come in. <laughs> I'll end up playing it. And I gotta admit, oddly, I should have ripped the shrink off right away. I'm almost, I don't want to rip it unless I'm playing it. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Okay. So, my number five game is Wellington's Victory by ST. Um, I brought this because obviously this is an old, old copy and the old, I'm sorry, SPI. 
the SPI Flatpak doesn't travel very well. But this is a game about the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, you know, it's such a well-known battle. Everybody needs to have one game on it. It's got combined arms. It's battalion level game. There's about 1,600 counters for it. The scale of the map is 100 yards per hex. It takes care of columns and squares and extended lines and skirmishers. So it, it covers all aspects of the, of the game, of the battle. But now I'm going to go off script. Mm. Because when I got ready to find this game, I looked through, I don't know if either of you guys know or people out there remember when there used to be books about war games. Yeah. I've got a copy of the Comprehensive Guide to Board War Games, The Best of Board War Gaming. Both of those are by Nicholas Palmer. Uh, you ever, do you remember Nicholas Palmer? I don't. He's, he's a contemporary of me. He's about as old as I am, but he, besides being a war gamer, besides being an author, he was a member of parliament for about 13 years, hmm. which is kind of an interesting little fact. But even Consumer Report had a book called The Complete Book of War Games, where they would talk about these are the, the good war games that are out there now. And we don't have anything like that now. But what is as close as we've got, like I said, I'm off script. <laughs> this is a book called Zones of Control hmm. by Pat Harrigan and Matthew G. Kirschenbaum. What this is, is this is 59, they edited the book because this is 59 different chapters by people in the hobby that either that talk about the past of games, what was Avalon, what were H.G. Wells games like, what were war games before that, the present and the future of war gaming, including the you know computerization of war games. Like I said, there's there's 59 chapters. They've got a chapter on Advanced Squad Leader. They've got a chapter oh. on Combat Commander. They've got a chapter on Empire of the Sun. Good they've job. got a chapter on Starfleet Battles. Cool. So they've Good got all of it. those things in there. And some of the some of the people that wrote this, I just picked out some of the designers that wrote chapters for this book. And it's people like Ed Beach, Lee Brimacom Wood, Jack Green, Mark Herman, oh, oh, Joseph Miranda, oh. Tetsuya Nakamura, John Prados, Ted Racer, Volker Runke, Philip Sabin, Rachel Simmons, Brian Train. Yeah, this is an excellent book to sit to read about where war game, you know, what, how did they get where they are? Why are they good? What can they be used for? It's still out there. It's a, it just came out in 2016. It's available on Amazon and Kindle. So like I said, I went off script, but this is, if, if you're serious about the hobby, this is a pretty good book to see what's all out there. But I'll go back to my number five game, owned but unplayed, is Wellington's Victory. Hmm. Well, they got neat things like We the Soldiers, all right, player complicity and ethical gameplay in Call of Duty Modern Warfare. But then Computer they've got game. right upending militarized masculinity in Spec Ops: The Line. Soroya Murray, Murray. Um, so very. Uh, I'm going to have to take a little screenshot of this and see. Uh, when did you buy this book? Oh, a few months ago. Yeah, okay. this is. This is the one I bought. It didn't like I got a copy to do a review. <laughs> oh, that one chapter looked interesting. Dealing with fanboys by Mark. Herman. Yeah, yeah, stalkers. <laughs> Stalker fanboys. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fanboy. How to get a restraining order? <laughs> That's right. There you go. Okay. I believe he did show up at his house. Yes, I have been in the fortress of epicness. Right. It's all where he designs his masterpieces. There you go. Been in a video. Yes. Okay. My daughter was the star. Yeah, that is true. Okay. My number four, owned but unplayed, is Crusade and Revolution, the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939. Come out in 2013 by Compass Games. I'm going to try this really hard because I'm a hick. Designer is David Gomez Rieso. Yes. I hope I got it. David, I tried. Sounds pretty good. I know a dude from Mexico speaks his, his native language. I asked him how to pronounce it, so I hope I got it right. Um, anyways, the, the game is a card-driven game based on Paz of Glory system. And 
we I was on a discussion about those type of card driven games based off of the We the People system and somebody said, Hey, have you ever played this? And I'm like, no, never even heard of it. Well Compass does a lot of they don't do a lot of your bulge, East Front, D Day, the popular topic, Civil War. They do lots of bizarre topics. And um so usually when I get their catalogs, they just kind of thumb through and mm, nothing catches my eye too much. So I probably thumb through. So when I saw it, I thought, well, never heard of this. Started looking and I, and I saw the designers like, oh, I know him. We slum together on the campaign commander forums. He's a good guy. And I thought, well, I hope his game does well because he's a nice guy. But mm -hmm. I started reading, I had great comments. So I thought, shoot, I, I like Paths of Glory games and, you know, I like to use war games to learn history. I know nothing about the topic. So... Anyways, snagged it in a big trade. It was like a four for four, and this was the star of the trade. Got it last fall. Would have loved it. Got it to the table. Um, more or less had some stuff going on first part of the year that just a lot of stress stuff going on I'm going to discuss, but it was more or less I went in the mood to war game. Got out of that, hit May, decided to spend a lot of effort trying to drop a whole bunch of weight and just didn't really have the focus for the war games. Now I'm back on the war games, but now, like I said, I'm going through all my Gettysburg games. That'll take me up to about November, of which then I'll start Bardius Con, where I play 30 games in 30 days solitaire. Then December, you can't set a big game you're, up. You're going to yeah. do that again? I got the wife's blessing. I got a great <laughs> plan this year. His wife will tell me again and again, no, no, he's not doing that. I was up yet. till like 2 in the I'm morning like, every yeah. night, but now i got to kill her plan to make it happen better. <laughs> so... That's she did agree. Yeah, you do have a smarter funny. plan. That is funny. Yeah, and then December happens. You want to set a monster game because I'll lose my game table. Uh, you know, around Christmas. So um, probably be about February, March before I get to it. But I really wanted to. And there is, Stuka Joe made a play, some of a playthrough video. So hmm. guys who do those videos, Callendale, Stuka Joe, all you guys who do this, much appreciated. When I get a new game like this, first thing I do, because I hate rule books, is get a, I like to see them played out. Then it kind of makes the rule books flow a little better. So all you guys doing it, keep doing your thing. That's my number two, Crusade and Revolution. Wow. Or your number four, you mean? Sorry, my four. Yeah, just the second one I covered today. That's right, yeah. So my number four is God's Playground by Martin Wallace. So this came out in 2009. It's a three-player game that deals with Poland from 1400 to 1790. And this was when Martin Wallace was doing his subscription games for the year. You subscribed, I think, four games and uh, you paid up front and then as they came out they kind of arrived and it's so obscure uh, I actually pulled this up even in one of the little scotch things that I did once because I was telling them these are the kind of games that I really want to play that it still intrigues me to this day but I've also heard that it well it's just with a three player only you have to have three players to play it's a little harder to get to the table um, of course, it's got a little bit of the whole Martin Wallace collector side of it. I'm not overly into that. I would just soon play it rather than collect it. But, but you uh, left the shrink wrap on. I have left the shrink wrap. <laughs> that way he knows what he hasn't played. The, the way you broke this down was really apropos where you've got 10, I've got 1,500, and you've got one in a book. <laughs> so, because he will ASL play. Scenarios, maybe, yes, he maybe. will play. Yeah, there might have been a scenario you haven't played. Um, just to explain some of the things... Uh, uh, there's several different ways to score victory points, uh, own land, religious activity, winning battles, um, surrounding Poland or her numerous enemies. So one of the really intriguing things with the game is while you're working against each other, you have to put in resources to defend against Poland's outside threat. And so if you're not doing that, the danger can obviously come from the outside. They had one weird thing in the... In the said uh, up to the players on how well they want to defend Poland, the enemies change their strength to match historical changes. So um, I, bet, I guess they're just simply basing it off of all the folks that have picked on Poland throughout the years. That, that intrigues me, this era. It's, I've never even seen it represented. Uh, God's Playground, my number four. Actually kind of make me bummed. I thought I had all of Wallace's war games. Okay, my number four <laughs> is Rock of the Marne. This is part of the standard combat series from what was the Gamers is now Multiman Publishing. Um, the reason I'm, every, I've got a few battles or campaigns that I'm really interested in. I've got I've got Marne 1918 Freedom Sturm, which is by Hexasim. 
I've got the Kaiser's Battle, which is the old SPI game. I've got Kaiser Schlock, which is a big Ziploc bag. There's like four maps and it comes in a bag this big. Um, these are all about 1918, the, when the Germans are attacking the, the big counterattack with where they develop the Stostruppen tactics and things like that. So this is Rock of the Marne. This is the one that I decided, uh, I, it's one I want to play. There's rules in here for like headquarters, even if they're cut off, they can still supply, provide supply one last time so you can duplicate the Lost Battalion kind of effect. Mm -hmm. um, it takes into account broken down tanks and of course it takes into account the, into account the Stormtroopers. So this is a game, this is my number four, the one I own and it's unplayed along with the, I kind of want to do that Kaiser Schlock too. Kaiser Schlock 1918, but Rock of the Marne is my number four. Hmm. Okay, my number three is The Great Battles of Alexander. 19, uh, deluxe edition, 1995. There's a, there was a one in 91 and there was a newer one a couple years ago. It's designed by Alexander the Great's uncle, Mark the Great. <laughs> the first one was. The other two have Mark Kerman and Richard Berg's name on it. You write these down, don't you? <laughs> I run them by my wife. Mm -hmm. If she says, you're a mess, I know I'm on to yeah, something. If she says, go back to work on it, I know. Hey, I'm still good. intrigued from the air war. We had Mr. T in the ball and a T-Rex in the tail or something. I forgot to mention Curly from the Three Stooges <laughs> was one of the waist gunners. I wouldn't have remembered. Okay. <laughs> the, um, anyway, yeah, The why would I want it? Mark Herman. Okay, that's pretty, okay. Also, it's really cool that if you got the system, all like the Civil War one, all kinds of battles to study. I, I hesitated for a long time because when I would see Richard Berg's name in the past, the first thing kind of my mind is Campaign for North Africa, it's supposed to be like the most complex game ever made. Um, the terrible swift sword, stuff like this, and I'm thinking, I think he makes games that are way, way too big for me. And I didn't know. Later on, Turning Point, um, the pirate game stuff like this and oh yeah he makes all kinds of stuff so i started getting a little interested i didn't know where do you start because there's so many of these games and there's not really a forum on board game geek for great battles there's probably some on con sim world but they don't thread their topics so it's hard to find stuff and um i was wondering what do you which where do you start well last summer my buddy rex the guy i mentioned earlier real good guy despite the fact he likes that ugly mythical bird from lawrence kansas that thing right there about to get eaten <laughs> Rex. Okay. Anyways, yeah, he wrote me and he said, "Hey, I upgraded my copy, and you know you love the great one, would you?" And he sold it to me for songs. So, yeah, I got it. <laughs> then I got stuck. Okay, I saw this simple great battles of history. Am I supposed to start? Is this simple battle? Is this great battle starter kit? Should I start with it as my first? And, I, and it's you know it's tough to find this stuff out. And I kind of got analysis paralysis for a while. Uh, recently, I was reading um, comments again. I'm trying to figure it out. And Mark Mazicki and um, Steve Carey, a couple of game designers, I respect their opinions a lot. I'd saw them say, "Yeah, the simple great battles reinvigorate, lit a fire into me. I'm playing these games like crazy now." I thought, "Okay, I pulled the trigger and grabbed them." So I still curious because I hear some people say, "Oh, yeah, just forget about it." Some people say, "Yeah, start with this." So I don't really understand what it's all about or how the system fits. So um, you haven't played this yet? No. I think it's because you're tired of Mark Harmon. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Just keep playing orange. Uh, anyway, the, um, so so yeah, I got this. We'll get it on the table probably within the first half of next year. But yeah, it hits big with me. Oh, the other thing is I've done, other thing is kind of, is sometimes I get games to learn about history. Sometimes I need a little kick in the pants to learn about, like go get a documentary. And about all I know about Alexander is what I learned in an Iron Maiden song. Um, so yeah, sometimes so I'll if I learn a little more, give me the kick in the pants to get it higher on the got some priority. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. anyways, that's my number three. Great I, battles of Alexander. You had a few rabbit trails on that one, but that is all right, brother, because that just means we don't have time to play games like Code Word Cromwell. This is my number three, The German Invasion of England, June 8th. Came out in 2014, Daniel Hodges. It's a solitaire game. The whole idea is that the Germans have successfully invaded England in 1940, 
which was what Operation Lion. Now, what was that operation? Sea Lion. Sea Lion. I knew it had a lion in it. And what this takes on, I'm going to real quickly, and then I'll move on because a, uh, I, I, when I purchased it, it's exactly why M. Kirschenbaum, who made a comment I wonder under if, the game. I wonder if that's this Matthew Kirschenbaum. Ooh, look at that! He had such a succinct wrap of what this was that I was like, I'm, I'm cutting that right in here. And I went, wow, look, I really need to get the book now. So he says, two mistakes people will make about this game. They will call it an alt history game and they will call it a role playing game. It is superficially both perhaps, but a closer, but a closer look suggests it is not much of either. Could a German invasion of England have succeeded in the summer of 1940? That's the old history question, but it's not a question code word Cromwell is much interested in. Oh yes, there's some stuff in the backstory about the Germans foregoing the raids on London to concentrate on fighter command and chain home, and were asked to accept that the Royal Navy mostly stays out of the way as the result of a secret pact with the U.S. for the greater good of the Allied war effort. But all of that is really just a paper-thin justification for the rural English setting and its cast of cardboard characters. Um, so what you end up doing is you're defending this, uh, these soldiers that are, these German soldiers that are coming into this this village. And I had it out, and I was getting her set up, and something hot came in, and I can't remember what it was, and it got tabled. And that's why this one's actually out of the shrink. It got close, baby. It got <laughs> close to being played. I think I did, oh, I know why it's out of the shrink. I did an unboxing and then I was getting all ready and then I did get sidetracked. And I had people calling for it saying, please, please play in a review. So I still need to get in there and get that, that one done. Okay. Wow, that is that's a nice little tie-in with Mr. Kirschenbaum there. There you go. Right on your that book. That can affect your mic. Okay, uh, so, shouldn't, but I'll, I'll move it in case. So my number th three <laughs> is Napoleon at Bay, the campaign in France for 1814. Um, this is one of the books, Kevin Zucker does many games on the Napoleonic era. This is one of them. This is uh, the 1983 version from Avalon Hill. You've got you have to worry about administrative points when you get ready to move your forces. You've got leaders. The leaders are the only things that are actually on the map. The forces they control are off map, hidden. So somebody will be, move, be moving. You don't know exactly how strong they are, but you see the leaders who are all rated for their initiative, for their command span, how many guys they can control, and how well they're able to subordinate to other players. Mm. Um, I've got some other games in the series, in the system. I've got the 100 Days Battle, which is Waterloo. I've got the Battle for Italy. But I haven't had a chance to get this one onto the board. A lot of the reason, you know, they mentioned, I, I, most of the games I've got, I've played. Uh, one of the re when I have a problem, it's because of the size. I don't have um, a huge table. This one has uh, two 22 by 34 maps, so it's a little too big for my table. I've got an extra thing that I use, but it makes it difficult to... So that's why I don't play a lot of the larger games, but this is my number three, Napoleon at Bay. I like the system, the parts I played, but I think it plays even better at this scale, hmm. with this big an area to worry about. That's okay. my number three. Clear these out of the way, too. Okay. My number two is Command and Colors Tricorn, The American Revolution, published by Compass Games, came out of last month in August. Odd Kickstarter, it came out, it was like a six week long Kickstarter, ended in May 31st, they said they'd have delivery in August, and I thought, mm, yeah, you guys are optimist, they did it. <laughs> well, that means they had it already. Yeah, yeah. I'm not used to seeing Kickstarters do ever be on time, let alone that tight of a window. Anyways, it's Command and Colors. Um, back when Richard Borg was the design designer, War Game Designer of the Month on the War Game Forum, it happens every month, you ask some questions. I threw out the question, you ever think about taking Commands and Colors to the American Revolution? It worked great as an expansion to the Napoleonic series. And he was kind of like, I know nothing. Um, I mean, it's kind of like, I can't talk about it. So maybe, ooh, maybe it's on the way. 
saw it, came out. There's going to be plastic figures in it. Lost all interest. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a big dude. Part of the reason why is because mm -hmm. you could have a lot of unit differentiation in grenadiers, fusiliers, light infantry, militia, um, provincials, things like this. And you can't do that with plastic soldiers. And to make that much different plastic is a lot for the molds. I knew that. So I thought, eh, they're going to oversimplify it. They change it to blocks. just mm -hmm. And um, then the thing that really, really sold me on it, because sometimes I get a little, I just wonder how Borg, he's can make so much money off of one system, but he does differentiate him a little. He has separate decks. He's never done that before. Like, Ooh, must have. I'm sad. <laughs> it's also my favorite topic. So, um, anyways, so then I jumped on it, got got an NWS instead of the Kickstarter. But I was really happy that they went with Compass instead of GMT because the quality is actually better, and that blew me away because I don't usually ever think anybody making something better than GMT. Um, Rule books full glossy. I believe I could be wrong, but from what I could tell last night, it looked like the train counters were a little thicker. Uh, they're they're like memoir thick. And then the other real kicker is the one thing about command and color schemes. They got cheap dice. They feel like they're plastic hollow. They're too big. They're not. They don't bounce around like you like on a dice tower. And then you got a sticker them, which I was like, yeah, that's mm -hmm. lame. This one had tinier dice, more dense, and they already um, has the logos already built into them. So, you still uh, got a stick of the blocks. No. Right? What? Oh, the blocks, yes. Sorry, yeah. not the dice. Yeah, oh, yeah. They stickered the blocks. That's All the reason right this there. thing ain't played is because I've been stickering. I'm, <laughs> I was stickered and stickered and stickered last That's night. That's the hard part when you get the game, you're like, oh, I got it. Yeah, it says on the back, this is not a complex game, but for experienced C and C players, there's a lot of new different things. I'm really curious to see what he does that is different besides the new decks. So, anyways, that's my number four. It has 12 scenarios in it. I'll, I'll go through all 12 like that because I just this is my favorite topic. Let me know when you're playing it because I'd like to play that way. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, my number four. Oh, sorry, two, fourth game. Of, I'm all backwards. Today. Right. Now we're two. Two. Command of Colors Tricorn, the American Revolution. That's right. My number two is War of the Ring, second edition. All right. Bam. Uh, it's It's... It's uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, they came out It's uh, with a updated edition. Um, I bought it as soon as it came out and it's kind of a beast to learn, although it's, uh, from what I've been told, it's extremely thematic and, and really ties in with the books and it feels that way. You've played, the, that's right, you are gonna teach me this. Um, and so it it sits there until you teach me when you're done with this and we're playing and then that one and this one over here. So um, um, everything I had I had read on it was that it, it is true to the books and it's a very engaging war game. And in that genre, it just had me uh, at that point. Now it does say two to four players, but that's it's really a two player game. I think You're it's just best sharing to two. up. Yeah. So um, if that is, yeah. I want to look at your Nazgul. Do you have uh, the first edition? I had the first edition, but I have the second edition upgrade kit. I've heard, that if I got it right, the first edition was too easy for the, was favored in, in, in favor of the free nations, and the second one is a little tilted in favor of Sauron. Hmm. I'd rather have it be tough. It should be. Um, but the first edition, the Nazgul stood on really tall, and I was going to tell you to take washers and glue them to the bottom to weigh them down because you don't want them tipping over and knocking your armies. The second one, they don't look as cool, but they're shorter, have a sturdier base, hmm. um, yeah. better center of gravity down low. So it's going to. Um, right so I was just going to warn you about that. Got it. But Good. yeah, I had second. There's an upgrade kit if you had the first edition. All right, second, that is my number two of owned but unplayed. Okay, my number two. So it is from Judd's Great Campaigns <laughs> of the American Civil War series, but this one is on to Richmond. This is a peninsula campaign of 1862. Um, the reason why I picked, well, it's because I haven't played this one, but I, the reason it's on my list is because I am interested in the Peninsula campaign. You know, can can the Union player without, you know, can he do better than McClellan? Of course, there'll be some rules in there and, and ratings where he, he doesn't become Superman, but can he do better? Same thing, 
Can Jackson do better than he did during the Peninsula Campaign? This system does a really good job of merging combat and movement together. So that's what, what uh, to me makes it uh, easy to come back to. They solitaire very easily because you randomly determine whose turn it is. You know, eventually, uh, you know, if a player runs out of movable units, the other person will be able to move, but it's easy to solitaire because you're not just going back and forth. There, it does get a lot of, as I mentioned in our Civil War episode, uh, the personalities of the war are important, and this rates a lot of the generals. So you get that personality in here. This is a pretty expensive game. I mentioned on our Civil War episode that I found it at a uh, Hobby Town USA, this one and Rhodes to Gettysburg, for $20 each, which mm. was great. Mm -hmm. But this was like one of the games that Avalon Hill put out in their last years of existence. So it's still pretty expensive. But On to Richmond is my number two game that I own it but I haven't played it yet, but I want to. Hmm. Very intriguing. Okay. My turn now? It mm -hmm. is. Okay. I introduced my number one game a couple of years ago. I saw a picture of a guy playing the game Gettysburg 150 by Worthington, and he had this amazing map. And I go, where did you get that map? Because the game doesn't have that. And he said, oh, Rick Barber's selling him over on Consim. We can find him on Consim World. I never heard of Rick Barber. And I went over and bought one. I thought, man, this guy's really good. He should do this for a living. Um, I looked him up and found out he makes lots of Civil War games and Napoleonic games. When he did Civil War, my number one game had a Rick Barber map. And I said I made vassal modules. Got up close on those when I was making those modules. He is amazing. I also found out he designed a game. It's my number one. Summer Storm, the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, he also lives by Gettysburg. He does reenactments. He probably knows every blade of grass better than any human on earth. How I many they call? I mean, how many games he's made on this topic? He's the only artist I bought a game because his name was on it. Stonewall Sword. Um, he is really good. It's a regimental level game. Um, I was looking for something. I have lots of light games like the Martin Wallace Gettysburg Gettysburg 150. I was wanting something a little more sim based without terrible Swiss sword. And I thought, I think this is going to be more into it. And the way he's into this topic, and I thought, I bet he does a really good job. Um, so, some comments are that the rule book's a bit tough. And that's part of why it sat unplayed for a bit. And I, I plan on, as soon as January comes, especially since I've been to Gettysburg and anxious to get these on, to spend a significant amount of time digging into the rule book. Because there's been a few games, you know, some rule books I don't have any problem, others do. Other games I've that people don't think are hard I've struggled with so but a few of them I've actually taken and rewrote the whole suckers and I thought if I can do that to help it I'll do that if, if I can figure it out and help others get over the hump I'll plus it helps me learn the games better so I want to take a lot of time just not hey, I'll spend a week reading the rules play a scenario and call. I want to set the whole dude up dig into this thing and get into it um, so I want to spend the time and I haven't had that block of time yet but that's why I want to get into it, because I really want a detailed Gettysburg game. And it's probably the most beautiful game in my collection. I saw a picture of a dude who had this map framed and hung above his bed. And I thought, man, his wife is sure is <laughs> sure is a winner, because I don't... He had no wife. Yeah, that's that's probably it. <laughs> it had to be, because I kept thinking... Were there my, fluffy my pillows? My wife was so cool with so many things. <laughs> On the she... bed were there big fluffy yeah. pillows that had very little practical use. Yes. But anyways, well, it's just, a, a I actually post that picture once and there's a bunch of guys in it. Man, his wife put up with that? So um, anyway, yeah, the, um, but it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous game. So that's my number one, Summer Storm, the Battle of Gettysburg. All right, my number one is Oh, Kimmich. and it's still in print too, oh, by the way. It's still in print. My number one is Kimmick. came out in 2012. Uh, the whole story here is that uh, you're playing in different Egyptian tribes, you have mythical powers of different Egyptian gods and then your powerful armies that come along with it. Um, I'd heard great things, uh, a lot from Tom Vassell and a lot of other folks, and so I went and picked it up. I'll admit it's a little bit uh, mythical powers, Egyptian tribes, and 
it was a little bit out of what would have been my norm. I keep hearing it's still wonderful. Uh, the problem is I'll get some kind of tactical level World War II game in or something, and I'm like, oh, let me try that. Or you'll mention your the new block game, American Revolution. I'm like, let me try that. So, Squirrel. Kimmet, though, I really, yeah, Kimmet, I really, really want to try because I, I hear it's extremely accessible all at the same time. Um, and it's different from what I would normally play. So it's my, it's my number one uh, owned but unplayed game. War game. Okay. And my number one owned but unplayed mm. is East Wind Rain. This is by um, Mark McLaughlin, uh, Napoleonic Wars, Rebel Raiders of the high, on the High Seas, and Chris Vorderbrugge, and I'm not sure I'm saying his, his name right. This is a Grand Strategic Pacific Front. What the, the physical thing that makes this game different is all of the capital ships in the Pacific Theater have their own counter. Mm. So yeah, this is, but this is grand strategy. Some of the things that this takes into account, um, I couldn't remember all of them, but it's force structuring and deployment. You make decisions for how to structure your force, how to deploy your force. You get large air battles between carrier groups in the open sea or between army groups over key bases. There's a lot of chrome to the naval actions because of the named capital ships airstrikes are unpredictable but then it also it shows the importance of building repairing garrisoning and capturing bases so this does you know things that other you know i've got a lot of pacific front grand strategic games but it sounds like this does some things that the others don't and then another reason there's a, a personal reason why i want to do this one I picked this up a couple years ago at the BG Board Game Geek convention, which is for our taping. It's going to be in two months. It's in November down in Dallas. And I went into the uh, flea market right as it was getting ready to close. I'd been doing something, got in right near the end, and I saw a copy of this. Had, you know, just thought, I, I could do all the other Pacific Front. Sure, let me go ahead and get that. And I asked the guy, how much is this? And he actually said, oh, you can have it. Thanks for all the videos you make. So this oh. was, that's part of, you know, that, that was a, a paying it forward to me. So I still want to get this one on my table. This is my number one game that I own, but I have not played it yet. East Wind Rain, The War in the Pacific by worldwide war games and it came out in 1985 so that's my number one Very cool any mentions that i mean i know we were throwing in is there anything uh honorable mentions sometimes you guys have a list or yeah there's i mean there's head. asl campaign games i would like sometime to do the uh the bridge too far complete campaign even though i've heard that it's balanced against the british hmm Okay. Uh, I would like to do the Tarawa campaign. And then in the operational combat series, I have not played the big scenarios for Burma. I, the people, um, some of the people I play OCS with started with Burma and they said it was very supply intensive. So I'd like to see what that is like because supply is such a big part of the OCS games. And um, I haven't played the big scenario of Korea. So those are, those are some things that are on my list, but rather than talk about those series, since I talk about them a lot, mm -hmm. I decided to go with the other games I could find that I hadn't played. Hmm. One of my honorable mentions probably would make you raise your eyebrow, um, Liberty or Death. Somebody mm, was- I, But I thought- Yeah, somebody was so convinced. I, the person asked me to keep their name anonymous because they said it'd be bad for the reputation to associate with me. <laughs> so convinced I would dig it sent me a free copy and I had to analyze and say, okay, because I had saw, I know the designer from Facebook um, and I had watched his development of the cards. I thought the cards looked intriguing because I loved the topic and I thought, mm -hmm. if great one couldn't make me love coin, I doubt there's a person on this earth who could or maybe I just missed something and this will do it because I really connect with the American Revolution. What if that person was you? 
Hmm? <laughs> what if you ended up making yourself like coin because of the theme? Yeah, and if it works and I go back, <laughs> cool. And it's, it's intrigued me. Another one, Spartacus. The, not the Euro game, but the card-driven game by Compass. Okay. Uh, I got, I'm just curious to see how it plays because I love those card-driven type of games. Hmm. Mine would be, and it might have even been way back to when I went to w, WBC with, with you that one mm -hmm. time. Um, I had, I was picking up some ambush games I didn't have. Well, there was one I didn't have, right. which was Leatherneck, which was the Pacific Marines. Right. Battle Him was their big standalone that takes to the Pacific. And I had fallen out, and then it was one of the last ones that Victory Games put out. It was called Leatherneck. And I picked up that, and then they had another one called Open Fire, which was the idea that you were basically a, uh, what do they tank. call it, a tank platoon, though. Several, four or five Shermans that are moving through, or five Shermans. And I haven't played either of those in the ambush system. I've played the heck out of everything else in there. But I would love to go back and, uh, and experience those, maybe with Bo. All right. Be sure That's to put it. yours in there. Top five. Yeah, put them in the comments. I know any war gamers have actually played all your games. Bam. Hamtag. Hamtag. And uh, what's the name Zones of the of, Zones of Control. Perspectives on war gaming. Pat Harrigan. Matthew, Matthew G. Kirschenbaum. And I will take a screenshot of it with my phone. Or a picture is really what it is. And I'll put it up on the screen. All right. We're out, guys. We're out of here. Bye. See you.